Okay, so Gibbs Free Energy or Delta G. You know what? I'm not entirely sure who Gibb was or what his free energy was. Sounds a bit hippie-ish to me, but you know what? We need to know about it. So Gibbs Free Energy, what's it all about? Well, is a reaction feasible or spontaneous? Now, I don't mean either or. They pretty much mean the same thing. But basically, this little calculation here takes into account all the different things that could indicate whether a reaction is going to happen or not, okay? Is it likely to happen? Is it feasible or spontaneous? That's what we're asking here. And it basically takes into account the three major things that can contribute to whether a reaction is feasible or not. The energy change, the enthalpy change in a reaction is really important, okay? So exothermic reactions are more likely to happen. The temperature is also important. Reactions are more likely to happen if there's a high temperature. And of course, hopefully you guys know about entropy as well. If there's an increase in entropy, then again, the reaction is more likely to take place. So it's really a balance of all three of these things that contribute to an overall view of whether a reaction is going to be feasible or not. So what the hell's the equation? I know what you're asking. What's the equation, Rich? Well, delta G equals delta H minus T times delta S, okay? So it's the enthalpy change minus the temperature times the change in entropy. Units are also important. Okay, so to calculate delta G in joules per mole, delta H needs to be in joules per mole, really important that. Temperature needs to be in Kelvin, again, very important. And our standard units for delta S are joules per Kelvin per mole. So notice there's no kilojoules in sight here, okay? So it's all about joules and you need to convert those units before you plug them into this reaction. So, you know, let's say we're plugging some numbers into this reaction. Well, what is the point? Well, this is the point. So once we plug some numbers into this, Basically, what the question is going to want to know is, is the reaction feasible? So for a reaction to be feasible, delta G must be below zero or negative. Okay, so delta G must be below zero. If it is, then the reaction is going to be feasible. If it's not, then it's not going to be feasible. Okay, so it's really a balance of these three things, delta H, temperature, and your entropy change of the system. So let's take a look at the kinds of uh, reactions that are going to be feasible and the kinds of reactions that aren't. So let's take a look at a qualitative view. So, you know, if we've got like an exothermic reaction and an increase in entropy or an endothermic reaction and an increase in entropy. So, you know, what can we do with those, uh, with those bits of information really about those delta H, T and delta S. Well, there's a couple of things we need to bear in mind when we're looking at this equation. Well, the first thing is that temperature is always a positive value. Why? Because it's in Kelvin, okay? You can't get minus Kelvin, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. There's no kind of energy that's less than that. So what that really leaves is a balance between delta H and delta S. And you can look at those two values and you can decide, even if you don't know the values, you can decide whether delta G is going to be positive or negative, whether the reaction is going to be feasible or not feasible, okay? So don't forget, delta G needs to be negative if it's going to be feasible. So let's look at the different combinations we can have between delta H and delta S. Delta H, delta S, and feasible. So is, is basically what we're asking here is, is the reaction going to be feasible depending on the signs of delta H and delta S? If we've got a negative delta H, so an exothermic reaction, and a positive delta S, so basically an increase in entropy, the reaction is always going to be feasible at any temperature. Now, the reason for this is that if this is a negative number, delta H is a negative number, and we're taking away a positive number, so temperature and delta S are going to be positive, then it can only get more negative. So delta G's always got to be negative if you're starting with a negative number and you're taking you know values away from it, then it's going to be negative all the time. So that's one combination. Well, if we've got a positive delta H and a negative delta S, we're never going to get a feasible reaction. The reason for that is that if we start with a positive delta H, so an endothermic reaction, 
and we take away a negative number, delta S, okay, then it's only going to get more positive. So a positive value minus minus, okay, a value that's only going to get more positive. So if we got this combination down here, the reaction in terms of the chemistry isn't feasible at any temperature, doesn't matter what you change that temperature to, it's never going to be feasible. Delta G is always going to be positive. But what if we've got a mixture? Well, actually, if we've got a positive delta H and a positive delta S, basically that depends on the temperature. Same likewise for negative, okay? So we've got two sets of negative values, that depends on temperature as well. So it really depends on the values you've got and the temperature that you've got that the reaction is taking place at, we actually need to do a calculation to find out what delta G is. We can't say for certain whether it's going to be positive or negative because it's a balance between those two things. Okay, so let's say you start with a positive value and you're taking away this positive value. Well, it depends on the two. Likewise, if this is negative and you're you know, negative, negative. So if you're adding this, then it's going to depend on the temperature that uh, the reaction is taking place at. Okay. So, you know, it depends if, if the reaction is going to be feasible or not. Well, you know, that really does depend on the temperature in this scenario down here. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Let me just show you. So we can rearrange the equation to find out, well, at what temperature is it feasible? Well, if we assume that delta G equals zero, okay, so if you eliminate that from the equation altogether, we can actually find out what that balance is between delta H and temperature, okay, and delta S. So if we assume that delta G is zero, then the temperature at which this reaction does become feasible, or in other words, the temperature at which delta G becomes zero equals delta H divided by delta S. Now, this rearrangement of the equation is just as useful as this one here, because I've lost count of the number of exam questions that come up whereby they ask you, okay, based on all these things, what temperature does this reaction become feasible at? So then you can just use this equation to say, well, at this temperature in Kelvin, that's where this actually comes into play. Okay, so we've got two equations here. You can rearrange that to get this, but you know what? I just remember this one as well. Really, really important, okay? So overall, delta G is an indication, the, the kind of biggest indication we've got of whether a reaction is going to be feasible or not. It takes into account enthalpy, temperature, and entropy of the system, and this is your equation. If you're going to use it, bear in mind that this needs to be in joules and your answer here is going to be in joules. If a reaction is going to be feasible, delta G has got to be below zero. And, you know, qualitatively, based on positive and negative values, they do love asking that. Just remember this, bear this in mind, okay? So one combination will always be feasible, the other never. But if they're both positive or both negative, we need to kind of start thinking about this reaction or this equation over here. Now, one last word of caution. A reaction may be feasible, okay? So in other words, have a negative delta G and that's all good, but it may still not occur in practice if there's a high activation energy. So thinking about kinetics, you know, you should know what an activation energy is. If that's particularly high, then there still is this barrier to get over for the reaction to occur, okay? So this high activation energy can still act as a barrier. So, okay, whilst we've said that delta G is pretty much the be all and end all in deciding whether a reaction is feasible or not, we do have to take into account kinetics, okay? So this gives us a really, really good indication, but if there is a high activation energy for the reaction, if we need to put some energy in, then, you know, we need that to kickstart the reaction, okay? It's not just going to happen on its own, okay? So activation energy acts as a barrier to the reaction. Bear that in mind. They love asking that question just for a cheeky little extra mark, okay? What else do we need to take into account? It's activation energy, okay? So that should give free energy. I'm going to be looking at some example questions in the next couple of tutorials, but remember these two equations and remember what delta G tells you.